Well, good day, everybody. This is Chris with the Ancient Scholar. I hope you guys are all doing well. I'm here at work. Uh, sun's coming up. Nice early morning. Uh, I'm on my um, third third cup of coffee uh, for this morning. I've kind of fallen off the wagon, so to speak. I um, uh, will consume copious amounts of caffeine and then feel guilty about it and uh, quit drinking caffeine for a number of months and then go back on the wagon. Um, so, hey, um, at least I have some experience with a s certain type of addiction, if you will, um, and I just happen to be studying a lot of toxicology, so I suppose that's helpful. Um, there are certainly probably worse things to be addicted to than, than caffeine. But be that as it may, I'm not I have not sufficiently guilted myself to uh, quit drinking for this, this go-around, but suffice it to say I will at some point. Be clean for a few months and then um, fall off the wagon again. That's just the way it goes. All right, so um, I've talked about the cytochrome P450 uh, monooxygenase uh, cycle, cytochrome P450 enzymes, uh, the very important phase one enzymes, uh, perhaps the most important when it comes to toxicology, particularly when it comes to. Uh, Toxifying agents, making them, making um, certain uh, certain xenobiotics, biotransforming them into more toxic metabolites, and um, most certainly when it comes to detoxification. And I, I won't really belabor all that. They're really important. I've done lots of videos on them. And now what I want to do is I want to talk about some other enzyme systems that are, oh, perhaps. I don't want to say they're unimportant. They're just not as significant when it comes to the big picture of uh, particularly toxicology. And uh, so I'm going to talk about another set of enzymes. Um, these are known as the flavin monooxygenase um, enzymes or the FMO enzymes. And these are fairly, well, all of our knowledge of enzyme enzymology is, is actually pretty recent. We really didn't start... Uh, coming up with a mechanistic understanding or appreciation for, for, en for enzymes. Um, you know, really until the 70s, 80s, and 90s, or really, and, and it, it, we still haven't really nailed, nailed a lot of things down. Uh, we just don't have uh, robust models that make, make these really incredibly good predictions. I mean, we, 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 we appreciate the, the big picture in some instances, in some cases, and can, can and make some inferences in other cases. Uh, but certainly our knowledge uh, of uh, enzy enzymology, particularly when it comes to these, these kind of these intermediate complexes that they're going on, this is rather incomplete. Um, and it, get, it really gets, really gets all mucked up and muddied up uh, it's particularly when you, you take have, uh, you, you take undergrad chemistry, general chemistry, and, and you, you kind of get this idea that you, you know, bonds are either you know they're covalent or they're uh, ionic or maybe you know metallic, and and you kind of throw things in these little boxes, uh, as human beings like to do. Uh, we get very euboxic and we like to label everything, and, and you find out really when you start looking at chemical reactions, particularly catalyzed chemical reactions. Um, what what constitutes a bond and a complex is really convoluted, and and um, I suspect that we're not really going to um, have a good uh, model that works in all cases and all all things, just because you know you ultimately you're dealing with quantum mechanics and this stuff is delocalized and it uh, it's just a mess. Um, but with that said, we have some general ideas. Okay, blah blah blah. Let's talk about the uh, next set of enzymes. So the next set of enzymes, uh, the flavin monooxygenase and the FMO enzymes, uh, we really didn't uh, really didn't think that there was much beyond the CYP450, the cytochrome P450 enzymes, until the 50s, 60s, when we started realizing, hey, you know, there are some some other um, substances that can be biotransformed, uh, particularly the soft nucleophilic. Um, uh, or, um, yeah, uh, soft and nucleophilic types of substances contain uh, sulfur, phosphorus, uh, nitrogen is a big one. Nitrogen is a really big one when it comes to the FMO enzymes. We'll talk about that in a little bit detail. And we start realizing, hey, you know what? 
these particular enzymes can uh, perform phase one or can catalyze phase one biotransformation oxygenation of some of these other complexes. So the FMO enzymes uh, were, are very similar to the cytochrome P450 enzymes in that they can oxygenate um, complexes. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, kind of their basic function and when we talk about um, the flavin monooxygenase, the, 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 the term flavin um, should be sort of familiar to you guys, hopefully, um, because this is, in fact, the flavin that uh, you see in FAD, okay? So basically what you do is you have this complex protein structure that makes up the bulk of the enzyme, and then there's a prosthetic group, uh, an FAD prosthetic group, that is uh, added to that that uh, the the protein. Okay, as lots of enzymes are, lots of enzymes have this structure where you have the main protein and then you have a prosthetic group. Okay, an a heme containing group CYP. Well, this is a, a a flavin, an FAD group that's added, and that FAD, of course, has as you know. From oxidative phosphorylation, FAD molecules are very good at, at swapping electrons, right? Uh, they can take on ele hi electrons, hydrogens, they can swap them. Well, that's handy because when we talk about CYP enzymes, you know, part of the monooxygenation cycle in that, in that particular context is not only are you adding molecular oxygen, but you're, you're adding an electron to the mix and that electron can uh, kind of help destabilize things, make things destable, quote unquote, if you will. And that allows that, that the breaking of that molecular oxygen, you can add an oxygen to your substrate, and then the other oxygen goes off and becomes a water molecule. And, and that's ultimately how you get that oxygen uh, to the substrate and turn the substrate into its oxygenated metabolite. Well, it's a similar process with the FMO enzymes in that, but they, 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 uh, you're actually using an FAD as a prosthetic group instead of a heme group, but it, it functions in, in very much the same way, particularly when it comes to nitrogen-containing substances, amines. Um, so when, when, we, when we talk about nitrogen containing, the, the, the basic, you know, where, kind of where we start when we talk about nitrogen-containing stuff is ammonia. Um, which is a nitrogen atom, aha, the big blue guy there, and it is bound to three hydrogen. So nitrogen is relatively electronegative. It's not quite as electronegative as oxygen, but it's still second group over on the right of the periodic table there with nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, fluorine. Okay, so it's pretty pretty electronegative. Um, so there you have it. So then what we can do is uh, we take this ammonia and this ammonia, these hydrogens can be substituted for other groups. And when I substitute a hydrogen for a group um, and I have like NH2, for example, we would call that particular molecule an amine. Um, and of course, you've heard of the term like catecholamine. Well, catecholamine is a catechol nucleus. It's basically a modified... Um, benzene ring with a little carbon chain and at the end of it there is an NH2 and some other group. So when I do that, if I, if I substitute one of these bonds, one of these hydrogens for let's say a methyl group, it could be some other functional group, okay, this is what we call a primary amine, okay, so primary is just one hydrogen is substituted and then if I were to maybe substitute a second hydrogen, okay, I would have a secondary amine, and if I substituted a third hydrogen, you guessed it, I would have a tertiary amine, okay? So that's just some basic terminology um, regarding amines that, that are important. Um, and this, the FMO enzymes are kind of important in, in when it comes to um, amines. They are not as important when it actually, when it comes to just like benzene rings and just carbon hydrogen bonds, um, the FMO enzymes are not really good at oxidizing carbon hydrogen bonds like the CYP450. Okay, so generally you, it involves some other atom other than carbon, like a nitrogen or a sulfur, something like that. Um, so yeah, the, the FMOs are a bit mm, provincial, I suppose, in some sense. 
Um, and in addition to that, uh, the, uh, the, the flavin monooxygenase enzymes are not particularly good at oxidizing primary amines. It's typically going to be your secondary and tertiary amines that we're really, really worried about. Um, so things like um, hydrazines, um, thiols, uh, thiocarbamides, et cetera, et cetera, uh, can all be biotransformed or they can have their, the, their oxygenation can be catalyzed by the FMO enzymes. Um, some phosphorus containing molecules as well. Uh, so yeah, there you go. That's basically how it works. Um, there are multiple types. It really comes down to the five major types of forms of FMO enzymes. There's uh, FMO1 through 5. How about that? Uh, <laughs> So there you go. Um, the FMO enzymes, unlike the cytochrome P450 enzymes, do not are uh, carbon monoxide does not bind to them. So carbon monoxide would have no effect. Um, they are not induced by phenobarbital. Okay. So uh, and I'm going to do another video on the induction of enzymes and the phenol phenobarbital is a really big. There's a lot of research that was done about that, and that's really where our our basic knowledge of uh, uh, enhanced transcription and blocking, um, uh, basically blocking uh, certain substances that um, inhibit the trans uh, transcription of um, of genes uh, that uh, transcription or yeah transcription of genes that uh, create uh, these these enzymes, but that that'll be another video. Uh, we don't see that with the FMOs, so certainly their their fundamental mechanism of action is is very different. But the end end result is that they still are oxygenating, so they're still phase one. Um, when it comes to toxicology specifically, uh, the the FMO enzymes are not as important, so I haven't really spent a whole lot of time studying them. Um, they are more involved in detoxication types of pathways. They're not as important as a, taking like a pro a pro drug or or something and turning it into a more toxic metabolites. Um, you don't really see much of that. They're more important in some sense when it comes to detoxifying. Um, there is a rare kind of syndrome that I think is um, perhaps an important thing to talk about. Just because it is just so specific to the, um, uh, it's so specific to the FMO enzymes, and this is actually a syndrome involving flavin uh, monooxygenase three or FMO three enzymes, is a polymorphism that some people get uh, of these, where they have an underexpression of the FMO uh, three enzymes, and there's a substance that's just nat it's just naturally created in the, in the gut during digestion digestion processes, it's uh, something called uh, trimethylamine, and trimethylamine is just uh, an amine with three methyl groups. How about that? Trimethylamine. So um, I have my nitrogen and three methyl groups. Now, this is not a toxic substance per se, not credibly toxic. Um, generally, most people have adequately normal uh, levels or a normal expression of the FMO3 enzyme. And so what happens is this um, trimethylamine can be oxidized into trimethylamine oxide where, you know, I uh, take an oxygen here and I can add an oxygen. Bam! All right. So we oxidize this. Now it's nice and polar. Um, we can get rid of it. All right. Easy, easy, easy. Uh, this is uh, slightly polar, I suppose. You know, the nitrogen's electronegative, but the lots of these these methyl groups really don't make it as polar. Um, okay, so in, in FMO3 deficiency or uh, decreased expression, what happens is the trimethylamine does not get metabolized to trimethylamine oxide, so increased levels of trimethylamine. And it's not particularly toxic, except that it can create a rather foul body odor, which has been described as fish odor, quote-unquote fish odor, um, or fish odor syndrome. The proper name is trimethylaminuria. Um, 
where you get increased levels of trimethylamine. So your your sweat, tears, urine, body 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 secretions can smell kind of fishy. Um, this is not again not, it's not life threatening, but certainly it it can uh, be very problematic as far as quality of life goes. There are diets, however, that we can put people on and some, you know, counseling, some other things. And generally, people can manage this uh, reasonably good. Um, but it is kind of just a real, very provincial kind of problem or syndrome that is related to the polymorphism of one particular gene that codes for the uh, F, uh, particularly a, 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 an FMO3 enzyme. So it was worth talking about. Okay, lots of rambling, but again, um, you know, not a huge thing when it comes to toxicology, but still, you know, they're like nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus can, kind of containing molecules. You can get some uh, monooxygenation of those through the uh, FMO enzymes. Uh, so there you go. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video, and as always, uh, thanks for hanging in there. I'll see you in the next video.